blockchain, we get typically we get two distinct reactions. Some say, wow, blockchain, that's going to change the world and make it a lot better place. That's a technology that is going to make societies fairer, more equitable, more just. My name's Jerry McCann, and I'm a proud member of the blockchain hype camp. And there are others who turn away, who say, this is overhyped. I'm tired of another technology. They say blockchain for peace building. At best, that is unnecessary, and at worst, that is completely destructive. My name is Maud Morrison, and I am a member of the blockchain skeptic camp. And I think this skepticism has a lot to do with that hype. So we see the headlines that Jerry just showed us, and we say, this makes no sense. And actually, we turn away from the blockchain discussion altogether. And that contributes to, I think, a lack of understanding of the technology on the part of skeptics like myself, and particularly skeptical peace builders. So I wonder if this reminds you of something. Back in the 1990s, we saw a very similar debate over the internet. So there were those who loved it, and there were those who thought it was overhyped. The utopian view that this internet was going to change our world for the better, and there was also a dystopian view that actually thought the internet wouldn't even last a year. <laughs> And more recently, we saw, I think, the same debate over social media. So the hype versus the skepticism. And I think it's safe to say that our failure to find any middle ground on this debate has brought us to a place where many of us don't feel comfortable. So in fact, one of the very reasons that we're at this conference is to discuss how we can reverse the unintended consequences of a technology that was once simultaneously overhyped and overcriticized. So wherever we are on this debate right now between skepticism and hype, I think one thing is for sure, and that is that blockchain is coming. And it is going to fundamentally change the way we work, both in peace building and in other sectors. So we think that we now have an opportunity, actually, to shape the conversation around blockchain and to turn the hype into grounded energy and the skepticism into an awareness. And by doing this, we can shape applications of blockchain and turn them towards applications that actually promote peace rather than divide us further. So what exactly is blockchain? Well, in the 10 minutes we have, which is now about eight minutes, there's no way I'm going to be able to help you understand this if you haven't an awareness of it. But in simple terms, blockchain is just a new way um, to, uh, to, um, <laughs> to record transactions. It's basically a transactional database. And what's interesting about it is that we as human beings are transacting all the time. We transact politically, we transact socially, and we transact economically. And oftentimes those transactions are recorded and they're verified. And those verifications are happening by third parties. So we have governments verifying our transactions, we have banks verifying our transactions, we have companies and accountants verifying our transactions. All of these are third parties that we're trusting to verify our transactions. And in many cases, they're not trustworthy. So we're in a real dilemma there because we put all of the trust in them. And as we've seen in many parts of the world, if the government's not functioning right or the banks aren't giving us a lot of confidence, that trust starts to erode, creating a lot of problems. So what blockchain does is it basically eliminates that third party verification process. So let me talk a little bit about the technology and how it works. First of all, somebody has to initiate a transaction. And this has to be done digitally. This is done either through a computer, a smartphone, um, an electronic card, or any other digital means. Secondly, um, that transaction request is broadcast out to a network of decentralized computers, basically what we call nodes. From there, those nodes are all receiving that transaction request from a specific user, and through a cryptographic algorithm, they are each verifying um, the legitimacy of that transaction request. They're all doing it simultaneously, 
and through a digital consensus deciding whether that's a legitimate transaction request or not. And once they do that, um, and this is done either through a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or the Ethercoin on the Ethereum blockchain, or this can be done through smart contracts, through reports, even through personal IDs, oftentimes through biometrics. But however um, that, that transaction is transferred, it is uh, then able to be, um, to be verified by each of the nodes in the, in the system. Once the nodes in the system verify that transaction, that transaction then is added to a block. And that block has other transactions that have already occurred on it. And each block, once filled with transactions, is added to a, a, a series of blocks, hence the chain in the blockchain. What it takes then is the request, the verification, adding to the block, and then adding to the chain. Once that's done, the verification is complete, the transaction is complete, and that transaction will never um, leave the blockchain again. So one of the things that we find really interesting about this as peace builders, and also when we're thinking about alternative economic models for peace, is that there are a lot of intrinsic values of this that we are not seeing in the, in the typical way that things are done these days. And this is very exciting for us. For instance, the trust that we can have in these transactions is quite remarkable. Because not only are the transactions um, quite transparent in the way that they're done, because they're shared across many nodes, but also the system itself is, it, sh it should be and typically is open source. Meaning that people can fully understand how the computer coding has been carried out and what is actually inside of the blockchain system. Also, as I mentioned before, we don't have the third parties anymore, so we no longer have to rely on somebody who really has nothing to do with that transaction. If I want to give money to Maud, why do I have to rely on Henny um, to decide whether that transaction makes sense or not, right? Why can't I do it right to, with her? So in that regard, uh, third parties um, eliminating them is quite nice. And finally, um, it's immutable, which means that it can't be corrupted. It sounds great, but <laughs> the way that blockchain is being applied right now actually often does not reflect any of the values that Jerry just talked about. And whilst we're thinking about whether we um, fall into the hype camp or the skeptic camp, Blockchain is already being deployed in conflict settings. And often it's being deploys, deployed in ways that we think are quite questionable. So one of the use cases that the blockchain enthusiasts like Jerry are getting very excited about is that of uh, identity management. So for example, how can we provide a digital identity for a stateless community that will secure their rights? And whatever we may think about, this is absolutely being done right now, or it's being addressed through blockchain. So there is an experiment happening, or maybe more than one experiment, in fact, happening around identity management on the blockchain. However, whereas the intent behind blockchain is to create this open network accessible to everyone, the system that this use case um, is actually being tested on is a permission system. So it means that you have to actually be granted access by an administrator to get onto the blockchain system. So it's actually the administrator who is deciding who is a member of this community. And so the decision over identity is actually being centralized on the blockchain. And this doesn't, contrary to all of the hype surrounding this use case, it's not actually empowering the community that they're talking about at all. And I would add that actually providing a blockchain ID for these communities is doing nothing to improve their condition. At best, it's providing another piece of evidence in their long drawn out campaign for identity. And at worst, I think the use of blockchain in cases like this is actually putting the lives of these communities at risk. So I would argue in cases like this, is the blockchain actually promoting peace? Or is it just a database managed and protected by a third party? So basically, we understand that blockchain is moving forward. We understand that 
because of the hype, there's a ton of money getting pumped into the space. And we understand because of that, there's a great deal of eagerness to put blockchain to work. And our concern is that that is being done in ways that are compromising what the system is capable of. So instead of getting transparent, accountable, and decentralized, we're oftentimes in the rush to put this into place, having things shortcut so we get opaque, controlled, and centralized systems. And this is, has to get us all quite concerned. So you've got two choices, we believe, as peace builders. One is you can treat this as a black box and pretend that it's um, going to somehow go away or somehow shrink back into the shadows. Or the second is we can open up the black box and make sure that we can better understand what this is about and the ways in which we can protect it and its integrity from the direction that it's headed. Mm -hmm. No matter what you think, blockchain is coming. And we would encourage you to please join us in a conversation to try and shape the way blockchain is applied in peace building. So please talk to us, email us, no matter where you stand, hype or skeptic, and no matter what your technical knowledge. I think that as peace builders, we actually have a responsibility to engage in this conversation and therefore to shape it. Thank you very much. Thank you.